Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the India China Institute. It's great to, to be back in this auditorium in, in particular, where we've had some of our most exciting events, and this will be among today's will be among uh, our most exciting events, uh, and you'll see why in a minute. Uh, my name is Mark Frazier, and I'm one of two co directors of the India China Institute. Um, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you and to introduce uh, our, our speaker today, our visiting artist uh, for the summer and fall of 2022, Hai Zhang. He is, as some of you know, uh, based here in New York, uh, was born in China, in Kunming, um, and began his career as an architect, and moved to the United States uh, about 20 or more years ago, began studying architecture, and then uh, moved into uh, what I suppose would be his real passion and calling, which is photography, uh, and has had his work exhibited in museums uh, and various other venues across the world, including here, uh, of course, Europe, Russia, Turkey, Costa Rica, and throughout Asia. As we will see, uh, he uses photography to investigate nuances and complexities of modern societies, including uh, what we'll see today, uh, urban China and urbanizing China. Um, he is the recipient of a Raphael Vanoli Architecture Fellowship, which led to the publication of a book in, uh, in 2009 or a few years later, uh, which he showed it to us yesterday when we were having a meeting, a really fascinating study. Uh, he had a chapter on China, but it was paired with other uh, uh, exhibitions in the book, uh, photography exhibitions on uh, Mexico City, Colombia, and Indonesia. Um, he is, his work has been nominated for the prestigious Deutsche Bors Photography Prize. He also has a series of photographs and, and collages based on a decade-long project in Alabama. We might ask him about that because like the one we'll hear about today, it's not just a one-time visit to or even a one-year visit to one particular location and embedding uh, uh, with uh, a community and getting to know it and, and photographing and, and, and you know, bringing it to light, but re repeated return visits to the same person or the same site, the same community over an extended period of time. Uh, that work, uh, the project, uh, the photographs from Alabama, from rural Alabama, by the way, are in the U.S. Uh, Library of Congress uh, permanent collection. So again, we're happy to have, very happy to have uh, Hai Zhang as our visiting artist for the summer and fall of 2022. And before turning it over to him, I will also uh, point out that this, uh, this artist in residence, if, as you, if, if you will, uh, is part, it can be considered part of our, one of our research clusters at the India China Institute on cities and citizenship. And in this research cluster, we're asking questions about uh, who, who who belongs to the city, who has rights to the city, that's an older kind of question, uh, but it's also a question about um, how is citizenship, uh, in a case where everyone has legal citizenship on paper at least, how is citizenship both in its inclusionary forms and its exclusionary forms practiced when everyone's the same, of, you know, citizen of the same nation state, i.e. People's Republic of China, but there is uh, very clearly a distinction in uh, sort of benefits and, and informal kinds of, of, of access to uh, benefits and services and, and formal in some ways too, uh, between urban residents who were born in a particular city and migrants uh, who were born in another city or more often in rural areas and who are, uh, as many of you know, uh, granted or, or as the case may be discriminated against for uh, merely for the fact of having been born not in the city. So the, photogra the, the exhibition we'll see today, or the, the talk we'll see today, and the, and the photographs he'll show us, I think, do connect very strongly with this question about um, who, cities, how cities change, how people change cities, how cities change people. Thank you very much, and let's please give an India-China Institute welcome to Hai Zhang. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity um, from India China Institute to give to me to be able to present my work here. Um, and uh, first of all, uh, before everything, I want to just thank um, Grace 
and Mark Manjari and our amazing team, uh, um, Anna Xu, Anna V. Um, it's, I, I don't want to pronounce your last name wrongly, so I just say V and uh, um, uh, Satchua Matt. And uh, without this amazing team, it's seemed possible for me as a one man team to do, oh, and the Yan team to do this website, uh, this presentation, and also exhibition um, in the lobby and also on the big windows over there just in short amount of uh, five months of time. That's very impressive and uh, very grateful. Um, without further ado, so which I'm just, uh, let's, go, let's just go into the presentation. So um, I think uh, I take a uh, um, beginning in a few minutes to take a, a moment to, to talk about a little bit the background um, of my practice and uh, how this thing started. Uh, so 2008, I was trained as an architect in China and also in the US. Um, in 2008, I quit my job as an architect and uh, decided to do photography. Um, one, one of the reasons is that um, as a Chinese, uh, visa is a, was a one of the biggest hurdles for me to go back and forth uh, China back then. So I, was, I didn't really spend much of time uh, for nearly decades uh, back in my home country in China. Maybe in, from 2000, I came to US, 2008, I spent only two weeks over there. All the, the amazing changes of uh, ch city and uh, uh, the country only look at the, I got to know from the magazines or newspaper. So I decided uh, to go back to China to quit job and to take photo to see, see what's going to ha what had happened. So I left uh, my job and went back to China as architect. First, uh, naturally, I was looking at what happened in the city. So uh, in the middle of the 2008, um, when I was looking for um, what I can do for uh, funding or make a living for the rest of the uh, time, and uh, uh, Rafael Vignoli Architect, they announced a call for proposal uh, to give a grant to do the research project. Urbanization is one of the uh, uh, area they are interested in. So we seized this opportunity and uh, got the grant. So from 2008 to 2009 to 2010, we did an intensive uh, uh, research uh, field trips in China, uh, basically in Shenzhen and Shanghai, um, and also photo uh, photographs and the interviews, everything. And then uh, we, 2010, uh, 2010 we, and when it finished, the project was finished and uh, we were very uh, proud we were included in this uh, uh, book. Um, and uh, by the way, the, the covers are, one of my book, uh, my photographs from Shanghai. So they say, uh, so after 2010, um, I still wanted taking more photos in China and uh, I was looking for what I can do. Um, is there any opportunity, some pitch I can get into? Um, I, from 1994, 1999, I spent five years to get my bachelor's degree in architecture in Chongqing. Um, that was the peak time of a Three Gorges Dam uh, construction. And uh, they announced the project, they are going to uh, flood the area and the people start to move around. And the Chongqing, because of the project, became the uh, direct affiliated city to Beijing. So everybody's life is uh, more or less has some impact from this project. So uh, I want to take the opportunity. I, I was looking around at any information and in 2010, I, on the China News Weekly, I read an article talking about uh, one or uh, a group of uh, people, how would I say a group? Some people from like 200,000 uh, Wai Qian, that means uh, moving out, uh, the migrants, they couldn't make a living in a new uh, settlement. They moved back to where they originated from. And, uh, but the or origin of their village is flooded, it's gone. So there's no home to go back. And uh, as Mark uh, just mentioned, they lost their hukou. It's a very unique uh, system in China. Um, it's very inflexible back then. So they couldn't get any benefit. So one uh, you know, amazing part of the story is one of this uh, group of people, um, he moved back to his origin where he can, Wushan, where he can find a lot of relatives but he couldn't find a place to leave because no benefit, no housing. 
he, his wife, and uh, his daughter lived in a tent, like homeless, on the riverbank for the entire two years. So I just uh, really intrigued by this story. I wanted to go by myself to see what happened, to hear the story from this person directly. So I started a journey looking for He Gui Zhen. Um, this is one um, interesting story, but the story itself led me into a very big, a vast, uh, unfamiliar part of China, which is a rural China. Also going through the bigger uh, transformation, um, kind of a quasi uh, urbanization. Is, uh, then I started uh, going to the rural part of China. It's really eye-opening experience. Um, I just uh, kept going back. So during the time, I made uh, two artist books. Uh, first of all, called uh, Don't Follow Me, I'm Lost. Um, that's represent exact my experience and my feeling why when just uh, back to China and the urbanization and the urban changes. The second one called the Unintended Home, uh, Homecoming. This is uh, mostly about uh, like a rural part of China. So as the title suggested, it's the unintended uh, uh, feeling of warmth and uh, even I'm not really familiar with. And uh, I start to obsessed to go there to take photos. Naturally, and uh, in my mind, uh, I want to make a, a China trilogy. And uh, naturally, so I had a two books, and uh, I had a joy making these two books. These two books uh, somehow made me some uh, great success. Some success, I had an exhibition in Europe, and uh, one of the book won the awards in Germany. I saw that the third part will be a book too. So I continue to go back to China to take photographs and uh, from the 2013 uh, and onwards. But the problem to me is no matter how much I, uh, how many times and how much I try, I couldn't make a book. Doesn't make sense. I don't want to, just don't, I don't feel it's right to put the interesting, interesting picture in a book format, just to make a collection of them. So I will show some picture to you. You will see what's going on. So this is the first of, one of the first few pictures I took in two, uh, 2013. It's in Wuhan, um, along the Yangtze River. The Wuhan too. It's in Nanjing, also along the Yangtze River. It's a rural part of uh, uh, Zhejiang province. So this is one of the trip uh, taken during one of the trip go to uh, northwest of China. It's Yinchuan, well, the um, Muslim um, region is one of the mosques. It's just because it's a uh, winter time. You can see the snow and the very dry. It's the uh, one of the traditional green train uh, from uh, Yinchuan go into Inner Mongolia. Um, it's a uh, on the river, uh, the Yellow River, the river bank. During the dry season, they make it um, like a recreational area. So this also on the riverbank, um, the riverbank of the Yellow River in Zhengzhou. So I think this lady was taking a TV interview talking about the, how to do the um, environmental restoration of this environment. Um, this picture is also in Zhengzhou. The, the grandpa and the grandchild, they were standing on the one of the oldest uh, uh, city wall in China which was built 5,000 years ago in Shang Dynasty. Um, doesn't, you don't feel like that, the pressures, right? And, uh, uh, people just walk around on that, and uh, it's part of the life. Uh, China's too much history sometimes. It's in Zhengzhou, um, along the uh, Huayuan Kou. So this one is one year after the uh, 2015 Tianjin chemical explosion. explosion and, uh, I went there back to see what uh, had happened. Um, you see the back side of the building, some windows were still um, missing. And uh, uh, the grassland, um, you, you can see here, uh, maybe we can turn down the lights a little bit. Yeah. So the grassland here was, uh, um, you know, um, because of the chemical explosion, a lot of the soils and the area has been contaminated. 
um, but the taxi driver told me and uh, the local authority put this garage uh, just in, uh, in terms of the three days of time because the, the official in Beijing is coming to review, to, to take a look at the, what, what they are not doing. And now the, the dogs, basically is a, uh, is a cover up and the dogs, the uh, kids were rolling around and contaminated the soil. So this is the last two pictures as the, uh, the, in the group of the last pictures I took in China before pandemics. Happenedly, they are also in Wuhan. So this one is in Wuhan, Hanzhen Jie. It's one of the pioneer area for the wholesale market. And uh, this very inventive, this um, motorcycle. So he uses his, uh, uh, the foot to control the brake and the acceleration. And this is the two hands that steal the directions. So on the back, it just um, put the luggage on it. So happily also the last uh, few pictures is uh, people sitting on the motorcycle, e-bike. Looks pretty happy. Anyway, so you can see that those pictures covers a lot of things, but that doesn't follow any linear narrative. So that's why I couldn't make uh, a book. That's no story. That's the story, but there's no single story uh, behind all these pictures together. I don't know what to do. So I just started some very mechanical job to archive to organize them. To put them, uh, uh, I selected the 1700 uh, pictures and uh, to categorize them and um, the, the cataloging and uh, put all the uh, date, uh, date and the place and the notes in the notebooks. And uh, I think this is how the archive things really started. I'm meticulously uh, documenting every single step I was doing. This I printed. Uh, the picture really prints as a two by three black and white print. I cut it and put each of them into a plastic bag as a preserving uh, them. And the scan each of them like a, a nine pictures in one sheet and scan them. And you can see uh, on the back over there, you can see the uh, the number over there. So they can always go back. It's like a, like a library. And we go back to for the, so this is the one, sheets before they were scanned. And uh, 2016, uh, my son was born and uh, that shows I was laying out this one on the brown paper. My son was, uh, um, I think two months old, she was leaving. Uh, he was laying on the yoga mat in the living room. So I think that uh, by September 29th, uh, 2016, I had a 185 um, sheets, archive sheet ready and uh, put into the three archive boxes. Of course, the picture I took after the 2016, I added more sheet into these boxes. So this box is, uh, was exhibited in uh, Miyako Yoshinaga Gallery last year in Upper East Side. And uh, she is Miyako-san, she was looking at, uh, looking through all the archive sheets, looking at the pictures. The pictures were really just uh, arranged chronologically, has no discrimination of uh, which one has a priority than the other. And uh, this exhibition you can see here on the wall is based on these three boxes of uh, archive sheet. So after this uh, archive, uh, three boxes of archive, and uh, also the exhibition, I really want, I found that this archive really means something to me. Um, also, people come to look at it, and uh, um, people said that they liked it in a way. So I really want to make something more uh, public accessible, and it's the information. It is uh, perspective. Uh, it's so much like a dictionary. I want people to can be able to read it, and I was to start to look for the opportunity and the support to do it. So fortunately, I uh, Grace saw this project, and uh, Grace introduced me to Mark and uh, uh, China and the India China Institute, we had an interview and uh, all these things. And we decided the way to go for it. And uh, um, so from the summer, we started as a project, but um, I guess uh, Greece know better. Um, 
working with an artist is never a uh, straightforward thing. <laughs> Always make things very complicated. Uh, I didn't want I when I got the grant fellowship, I didn't want to archive this part um, because it is there already. And I want to take opportunity to expand, to go back to the 2008, the first trip I had in China. If I can see if we can make all those photos, experiences um, into the archive, make it a real thing and as a testing board for the whole thing. So um, we, in the summertime, we did a lot of uh, writing and uh, go back and forth, look at things. And uh, we uh, had a, uh, by last week, we had uh, two collections uh, on the Bing website, uh, which is a digital archive. Um, so we included the looking for her region and also friction of everyday life, which is a uh, urbanization, urban village things uh, in Shenzhen and Shanghai. Um, so I'm just going to go through some images, talk over some stories behind uh, the pictures uh, in these two collections, but I'm not going to. So Hegui is, um, let's say, is a native of Wushan, uh, Wushan, Wushan people. Uh, Wushan is, uh, if we understand the Yangtze River, I, Yangtze River, uh, Wushan is the last uh, sizable town in Chongqing region uh, along the Yangtze River. And after Wushan, water will flow into the Hubei. So Wushan almost the last part of um, Three Gorges uh, things. And uh, He Guizhen grew up there by generations. Generations of his family grew up there. Um, in 17s, he's a man who has only one arm. In the 17th, he was using uh, dynamite for fishing. Accident, uh, the accident happened. He lost one arm, had some injuries on his face. Um, but at the beginning of the reforming time in China, he was able to make a decent living by selling the craft, uh, the antique to the tourist. Um, but the Three Gorges Dam, the, the construction the project changed everything. The water raised, he lost his home and the villages. And uh, uh, the promise the tourists never came uh, enough to buy his things. And then he decided uh, to take a chance uh, to move to the other provinces, since like that way he will get more, get more compensation than just to stay in Wushan. So 2003, he moved to uh, Hubei province uh, in Jingzhou uh, with his daughter and the wife. And the two years after, he couldn't make a living over there. And he moved back to Wushan and hoping that something uh, could uh, possibly happen for him, but didn't go that way. And he lived in the tents for two years. And uh, so that's a little bit of background of this person I'm looking for. So I went to Wushan in, uh, like, uh, in June 2010. And the, the first night in Wushan, I saw this thing, so a bunch of people, a lot of people, not a bunch, a lot of people were gathering in the people's square to looking at a promotional gala sponsored by a real estate developer. So I spent five days in Wushan looking for her region. This is a guy, he's a Mr. Wu. I don't know that the young Ch generation of Chinese still remember this. It is called a Modi. It's a motor taxi. Um, so it's illegal in a way, but that can get you to everywhere. And it's cheaper. And the rural part, you just hop on on the back and go. So Mr. Wu was uh, driving me around with his motorcycle uh, to look for Mr. He Guizhen. So this is where Mr. He, he Guizhen came from. Literally, his uh, original village is under the, under, uh, under the water here. So it's a Long Menxia here. So you can see the water has raised. Well, I don't know the, because there's no picture to compare. And, uh, but you can see the uh, mark over there. That's no vegetation. That means the water go up and down. So in one of uh, uh, He Guizhen's Lao Xiang is a fellow village, villagers home. I found this very simple question mark, a uh, cross mark, and uh, he told me he was a Christian. Um, in a way, he told his practice is illegal. He had um, had troubles with some uh, local authorities. So um, this very un, um, unremarkable picture here, 
but it's very important to me. Um, when I went to a Dong uh, Guihua village, um, why the, because of those pictures, uh, these buildings reminded me what I did when I, uh, in 1996, when I was an architecture student. 1996, uh, Wushan announced the blueprint, how they want to build the entire new town for this uh, migrant and this new settlement. And so they need a lot of architect, engineer, and um, uh, contractor to do things. Um, I was studying architecture. My professor got a huge amount of work to do. They couldn't finish it. So they start to su uh, subcontract students to say, do you want to do this? Do you want to do this? And um, why not? And this is money and uh, it's a gig. You can, and the way they give us some like a hand, almost a handbook kind of thing. Oh yeah, this is the new, new rural China, new village in China. We build this, uh, they call the little streetscape and with a two story building around it as a tile, as a cladding, it's new. And uh, we just take it and we do a lot of things, these kind of things. But without anything, um, without knowing anything about the who's end user and how it's going to be built. And I never even thought I would one day look at uh, to encounter these kind of things. So I was really shocked and uh, looking at, oh my God, they really they build this? But um, this building, are, none of them are occupied. It. And I asked the migrant, where, migrants, uh, the villagers, what's going on? They said, we don't want this building. It's a really bad design, bad constructed, uh, construction quality is really bad. And um, also the local authority want to sell this to us for profit. We don't, if we have money, we're, we are gonna just build our own. We don't want to do any of this. So this building has been empty for how long? Uh, 1996, 20 years. So that's really shocking time, uh, shocking. And uh, kind of, I feel a little bit ashamed what I did, but at the same time, also not a drive for me to continue the project because I know one way or the other, we are related. Nobody can say I have nothing to do with what, what, ha what whatsoever has happened. You always have something to do with what happened. So this is the one thing. So this is a Wushan. You can see this, uh, that on the left hand side is a historical picture. Um, and the big one is what I took. So they moved the entire town all the way to the top of the hill above the 175 uh, elevation. So finally, I met a Mr. He uh, in his home. He is Mr. He Guijian. Uh, he rented his uh, uh, apartment from his uh, brother. And uh, he pointed out the uh, certificate of awards uh, on the wall and uh, his uh, daughter um, got. He was very proud of uh, her daughter, was a very good student in the high school. This is Mr. He Guijian. So we went out to have a walk and he was uh, telling me I pointed to the riverbank where he uh, set up his uh, makeshift tent for two years. So after met, I met Mr. He Guizhan, I went to Jingzhou, uh, the Gusong village. I want to see what, um, uh, how he lived uh, in Jingzhou, migrated to, why he decided to leave. So Jingzhou is uh, in Hubei province and uh, uh, that's no gorge anymore. And uh, yeah, uh, Yangtze River become white. So this, uh, this uh, uh, boat here is made in concrete. The seventies, sixties, China said there's no steel and they want to buy any steel from America or uh, British. We're going to build a boat with uh, concrete. And uh, they did. And uh, this is the one um, uh, in Gusong village, uh, one fellow migrants to home. We had uh, the big uh, lunch, um, the feast. And the, the older uh, gentleman who was not eating is one of the activists uh, from uh, Wuhan, uh, Wuxian. He tried to get everybody to benefit back from the authority, from authority. but uh, he didn't have uh, didn't have anything. He to make living by uh, as a caretaker at a fish pond, and also in exchange for boarding in the storage room next to the fish pond. So this is the house Mr. Hugrigen bought. Uh, when he migrated to Jingzhou. So this house doesn't look very bad. It's a concrete, pretty spacious. Um, 
problem for him is uh, the house doesn't mean so much uh, for him. He couldn't make a living over there. There's no land for him to farm. And uh, his living the bay is upon, uh, just, uh, rely on the water. There's no water there. And uh, he was working, he needed cash. And he was working in the brick factory just next into the village. He was paid uh, 0.2 cents um, per brick if when he bring, uh, bring the one brick onto the truck. So with one arm, he can earn the 24 yuan RMB every day. This is, it's, it's not gonna, it's not gonna sustain. So no wonder in two years after he decided to move back to Wushan to see what happened. So he asked me to take, um, if I would ever go to Jinzhou, take a picture of uh, his old house and bring it to him. I took this picture. And uh, in November 2011, I went back to Chongqing, Wushan to, to see him again. And I, uh, when I arrived in Wushan and I couldn't find him, I called him and said, I left already because my, uh, my daughter is in the high school. I can go do the small business somewhere else. So he went to Chongqing and, uh, to start to selling the craft and antique again in the flea market. So it's a lot of uh, vendors, the uh, family business. So the older kids have to take care of the younger kids during the business time. It's where He Guizhen lived in Chongqing when he was doing the selling uh, craft or antique. So this one is um, 2011. There was no Meituan Airport, anything that you have to really go to the place physically to buy. And you see the gigantic uh, menu. It really remind me uh, my college time in Chongqing. And uh, we ordered a very spicy uh, Sichuan food that shared with other uh, sellers and vendors in the flea market. It was pretty good. So two days after, He Guizhen has to go, has to leave again with all the vendors to go to Henan to buy new, more antique. And this is the luggage. It's a bottle of a hot liquor and the uh, toothbrush and the bus station. It's a, it's a very touchy moment. And uh, when his big boss came out from the garage, he opened the window, he poked his head out, say bye bye to me. I think back then, uh, the, both, none of us, both of us know that um, probably we'll never see the, uh, each other again. <laughs> Cause, um, but in 2016, I called him again um, for some reason. And he told me his daughter uh, is in the college. And his daughter was the first uh, uh, mem uh, like a person in the in entire extended family who goes to college. He's very proud of it. So next thing is uh, uh, the, we go back to the city <laughs> now more. There's the urbanization um, in Shenzhen and Shanghai. That thing also, the, this whole region has a little bit of a linear narrative, but the Shenzhen and Shanghai is just a more broader, uh, broader topic to talk. So Shenzhen is a place, it's a migrant, um, it's a city filled with migrants. So uh, for the low wage migrant workers, they have to find a, a affordable housing in order to sustain their living in Shenzhen. So a lot of them young, uh, low wage uh, migrant workers, they live in this place called the urban village uh, for migrant, this informal, of the housing, uh, but uh, very affordable. Um, but at the same time, the, when the city started to expand, developer and the authority really want the land back for them. So they start to demolish in a lot of them. So this is one of the urban village in Shenzhen. They house the uh, 60,000 migrant workers. But uh, in March 15, 2009, they decided to evict everybody out. They are going to de demolish it. And then uh, it is a night of uh, not evictions, just like they say, announced. So the electricity was cut off. So you can see this. Uh, it's a May two thousand eight. Uh, no, April two thousand nine, June two thousand nine. Pretty fast. Um, October two thousand. Uh, I think it's uh, August two thousand nine. October two thousand nine. One year after, and I haven't finished yet. So this is also very, uh, you know, interesting because I didn't, I saw that everything is done already. I didn't even bring my camera. 
a big camera with me. I had a little small camera. I saw the building still there. So I had to take multiple pictures to com compose this one. So it's nothing, even in Shenzhen, the Shenzhen, Shenzhen speed, in seven days they can build one floor of high rise building. They couldn't finish this thing in one year. Not, not everything will go, can go as planned, but eventually they finish this project uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. They build an American style shopping mall designed by SOM and uh, but opened in 2020 and uh, not, 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 not very good timing. All right, anyway. So this is the last hotel in the uh, urban village. Uh, you know, the urban village, because the, um, the building code is very vague. That's no building code. They call the handshake building. Um, this is the, called the last stronghold. Uh, in Chinese, they call the stubborn nail, uh, Ding Zhu. Uh, they, I think the owner of the building didn't think uh, he was compensated fairly. He didn't want the developer to uh, destroy his building yet. Uh, liquidation in the village. So this one, interesting, they are not moving out. They just uh, hunt, uh, they're hunting, moving out to the urban village. Every, every day we go to the village to see what's going on. You always see the bunch of the young people moving from one place to the other with suitcases. They are hunting for the cheaper rent. This is the demolition going on. So the building owner, every day they, like they, they put the rent a little bit lower. And uh, let's say, if you say for uh, 10 more days, uh, five more days, and you can get you can pay lower. So this, you know, people start to look for uh, lower and lower thing. But the building owners still make a benefit because they are not providing anything like this. So this is one family who lived in the village for twenty years. This is a not a great room, but it is a room. <laughs> um, it's a house. It's a has a kitchen. It's a sun. So after the village was destroyed, and with the same amount of money, he can only rent one room, and the entire five members family live in one uh, bunk bed. So this, uh, this character is a pretty famous character in Chinese. It's a Chai Damolish. Um, during the, for a long time, for decades, everywhere is that, and uh, people are so afraid of it, because that means uh, developer or authority is, uh, is going to after you and your building will be gone. Um, so I was looking for this word because that will, will lead me to some interesting investigation. Um, this word, yes, uh, in Shanghai led, led me into an investing, interesting investigation because uh, this, uh, I didn't know this word character wasn't painted by authority or, uh, nor uh, developer, it's by the residents. They were stuck in the center of the Shanghai they want their building to be destroyed, to be demolished, and then they can get a compensation. Eventually they can move, but nobody will come to, to them. Though, so because they live in this kind of building, uh, behind of, uh, um, talked behind of the high rise towers and the land cost was so too expensive, uh, building code and uh, um, uh, zoning makes uh, developing this uh, land is too expensive. Nobody really want it. I met this uh, um, one of the residents. So this uh, old lady's home, he, she used the bricks to raise the bed you know, to avoid flooding. The bedroom. So the uh, roof is collapsing. So um, they use the hair, they use the dresser as a column. Not the two old couples. Those building, most of them are built uh, during the 1947 to 1950s, very old construction. And uh, so the condition inside was like a lighting, everything was really uh, outdated. And now the uh, high rise buildings surrounded and makes it even worse. So this is one of the courtyard. And then uh, before 2010, uh, Shanghai Expo government, the Shanghai government offered them uh, one last opportunity that I'm going to compensate you while doing the infrastructure here, maybe. And then you can go. Then this this guy said uh, doesn't think he's uh, uh, compensated fairly. It's true. It's a huko thing. He had a multiple family member living this house, but he only had one huko here. So he has to use the one huko's compensation to buy houses for 
multiple family member is not possible. So he is a bat. He was betting on next opportunity, which who knows when it's going to come. And there's a beautification before uh, Shanghai's uh, um, expo. And uh, before six months before expo, everywhere is, uh, uh, all buildings are covered by scaffolding. Um, they are renovating something. Six months after, you can see that it's, uh, it's just a painted. Um, that somehow reminded me when I was a kid in the 1980s, uh, uh, the, queen, uh, the queen of the England came to my hometown in Kunming. And my, my hometown is a small city. And it's just a painted everything to pink and uh, or pink or this like a bright yellow color makes the whole thing very beautiful. And uh, in Shanghai, majority of uh, uh, labor is provided by migrant workers. Um, one of this thing, but in terms of the policy and the urbanization and uh, migrant workers because of hukou things, they are least concerned of a group in any of this discussion because they are not in that equation, but they are basically, they need they are the people who need the uh, affordable housing at the most. They need the benefit and the uh, uh, safety net at the most. So this one is uh, also in Shanghai, like a, a group of uh, young, uh, new recruited uh, workers from uh, countryside come to Shanghai and they were waiting, it's just arrived. Uh, they were waiting for uh, being picked up to the factories. Um, so that is the visual things um, we have for, um, we have for today. And uh, so it's up to this point, we have the two collections on our scene. And we know uh, evidently, I think uh, the being website at this moment is just in Chinese, we have a uh, idiom to say, we cast a break to, to get a better jade. Um, so we are hoping say this is, is a star point. I really hope this is a star point. We are looking for um, every possible way to expand um, the archive in terms of uh, contents from uh, my collection of uh, photos and uh, uh, notebooks and all this thing. At the same time, we want this one to be a living organism, not only about my uh, collection, should be from uh, all the people who are interested in China. Uh, for example, some discussion of uh, something is a new perspective, some perspective could be organized the essay and uh, some new generation of the Chinese uh, uh, photographers in China I couldn't go right now because of the quarantine things and uh, don't make any sense. Um, I, we hope they can do continue to pick up something and uh, we can find a way to incorporate those things into our uh, collections, make this ever expanding, um, just like a dictionary, they revise every certain years. And it's always like, it's almost like a reference book. You wanna go there, you look at the words, Every time you look at the words, you get a new perspective of the things. And uh, also the from the technical part is um, we are looking uh, for the possibility to, to expand the technical thing on our website is uh, to tag, um, index uh, the images so people can search images uh, through the like keywords. And also the keywords, not only for the searching to find the picture, also the uh, the visual and the words, the text combined together make a very interesting suggestion of the understanding of the uh, understanding of the contest. Uh, so I take the last. Uh, I want to take the last few minutes to talk about the archive. Just bear with me for I know it's very long. Uh, the archive. So back to the title of uh, today's uh, presentation. Uh, the digital archive in the age of flux in China. China is a place uh, ever evolving, always changing, uh, full of sensations. If you, anyone of using the WeChat, every week there's one sensation or two sensations. It's incredible, it's impossible to, to think that um, all of a sudden, uh, millions of people are 
posting one thing, looking at the one thing, you think the revolution is there. You think that the, they are looking at the, the talking about the most important thing in the entire world, but two days after switching to the other things. And then next week is another things. So what, what the archive can do for us in such like a flux, age of flux, not only in China, in America, same thing, uh, same thing too. Election just happened and the uh, things go up and down and uh, everything's happened. I think the, the archive, uh, the reason I really um, obsessed with archive is because archiving this process really altered me, altered my relationship, uh, the relationship between uh, myself and uh, the subject matters. In this case, it's in my home country and also many other things. It's I can look at the things rather than look at things in a longer span, rather than narrow-mindedly looking at one thing. Archive uh, naturally just evidently revealed the pattern of the reputation, pattern of the, our society, and we can learn what that is. So it's a, we are living a, like a, the a, not only this age, I think in the human history is almost like the fragmentality, the fragmental life. The, so archive give us the understanding of totality uh, versus the fragmentality. At the same time, back to the original um, or original idea of this uh, project uh, uh, tied to citizenship and the, the city, uh, cities. And the archive has the, the other side talking about the country and the countrymen, countrymen, countrywoman, which is the citizen, citizens of this country. The country is a very abstract concept, especially for Chinese. We always say country above everything, um, patriotism, and uh, what is a country? Archives really reveal the things that the country is made of little tiny, many particles of a human and uh, events, small things. And it's insignificant, insignificant. That is the part in that the archive revealed the indiscriminately and uh, without any priority. So that is the, I think that is the thing we are looking at uh, um, uh, archive. And uh, that's why I think the archive is very important. And I hope uh, you can go to on our app website and you, I encourage you to look at the gallery and also the, all some, uh, uh, exhibition outside and uh, hope you have some uh, fun with uh, the archive. And I think uh, that's it. And uh, I want to, uh, if anybody has a questions, I'm happy to answer. One question right here, if you want to answer. Ah, okay, um, somebody asked what uh, did I use uh, to shoot the photo and in what format? Um, uh, I can use it. Uh, somebody asked a very uh, technical question. Um, maybe I use that. What kind of photos? Uh, what kind of I, what did I use? to shoot the photos in what format? Um, it sounds a very technical question, um, but I make it a less technical. Anything available? Um, but I, I don't use zoom lens. Um, I use always use, uh, um, traveling China to me uh, has to be something um, small, light, and I can move around. You can see I walk a lot. So I have a little camera bag, it's this size. Uh, donkey. This is very. Uh, and I have a Leica digital camera with me, a thirty-five mil, and I have a Mamiya Six. It's a, a media, uh, media format camera. Both are very small, and you, when you collapse it, and you put two cameras can fit in one bag. This bag is only this big. Um, but the lens, uh, I don't use zoom lens. Always a thirty-five mil or fifties. So because the lens, 
make me to be aware of the subject matters. I have to be in front of them, not to, to be in the distance. So I always be a part of these events. That's, I think it's a very, very important um, part of uh, the whole process. I think most of the time people are pretty open hearted. If they don't see you are, um, they all always, I think people are smart in general speaking um, to uh, assess if this is a dangerous situation. Um, for example, uh, looking for He Guizhen, um, when Mr. Wu to drive motorcycle, bring me to the village and uh, I sat down with them, they just didn't ask me um, who I am and they assume I'm a reporter. But I'm the reporter is going to get that story out, but I'm not from uh, um, some reporter um, will make the harm to them. They tell me the story. But at the same time, uh, for the first two days, nobody wants to tell me where He Guizhen is. Until uh, almost the last day, I hang out on with the vendors in the uh, River Park. One guy said, okay, you have been here for a long time and uh, I'm gonna make a call to her region to see if he agreed to see you. So always like uh, show your sincerities and, uh, but I don't know, I guess people, you have to trust they are smart enough and uh, you cannot trick them. I have a follow up on that question. What did you tell, um, you know, did you encounter police or kind of officials who were saying, who are you and what are you doing here? And what did you tell them? And, and uh, you know, more, maybe more generally, just ordinary people um, who asked you, what are you doing walking around with the camera? Were you talking about photographing, um, you know, uh, uh, putting together bits and pieces of the nation or what, what sort of uh, explanations or responses did you give to officials and to just ordinary people who asked you, you know, what your purpose of traveling and photographing was? Uh, interestingly, I, I, I always tell people the, tr the, the tr sort of truth. Um, when I walk around people, um, uh, people like, uh, um, for example, if we walk into the small like restaurants, they will ask you, why do you take picture of my place? And uh, ask her, can you uh, post, sit here, I take a portrait of you. And uh, like uh, vendors on the street, they will ask you, uh, why, why do you do this? Um, I will tell them um, I'm an artist. Um, I'm um, taking photos of this uh, in Shanghai or Shenzhen and wherever. I'm uh, making a book uh, of all these things. I'm uh, curious, I need to know. And at the same time, I bring some photos I took before. I will show them to say, this is a photo I took. Um, so most of the time they agree upon and uh, say, okay, yeah, you can do whatever you like to do. But, and then the official thing, it's also, it's interesting. They will ask you what they're doing. Um, they're always suspicious. Um, during the research uh, project uh, with the Vignoli's uh, uh, foundation, we printed the name card um, with the, the Rafael Vignoli Research Fellowship on that. We went to Shanghai and uh, in the Shenzhen, we had to interview some officials and some like um, designers, the architect who work for state-owned big uh, design institute. We present our credential. Most of them said, okay, and they, uh, they are open-minded and they tell us what they were doing. Um, but I remember one thing, one time, one lady in Shanghai and uh, I was waiting in Shanghai, like a state-owned institute, design institute. I was waiting for her outside of her office for a while. And finally she's agreed upon to see me. I sit down, she looked at my thing and said, tell me the truth, why are you here? I said, well, did you, I told you the truth. I'm doing a research project. Why do you do a research of these things? This thing doesn't mean anything. Well, that's pretty revealing, I guess. Yeah, so this is the, hope this answers the question.
So this is, I think, a follow-up to the first two questions. The pictures that you take of people, do they have the chance to see those pictures? Do you go back and engage through the medium of your photography with the subjects of the photos? Um, uh, yes, I try, try to find every opportunity to provide a photo to them. Um, uh, they either bring the actual print to them for the old people if they don't have a um, cell phone or email. And uh, for the young people, I always get their uh, tax uh, numbers and the uh, cell phone numbers and will text the picture to them. And uh, uh, as a matter of fact, a lot of people in you have seen here in, I saw them multiple times and uh, in Shanghai, in Chongqing and uh, other places. It's always always fascinating to me to see them again and to see what has changed or what hasn't changed. Any question? Sorry? Um, yes or no? Uh, at the end of the day, I don't think I'm a journalist. I'm not reporting the everything, um, continue to reporting the same thing again, again, again. Um, to me, it's a little personal. I have to honestly uh, speaking this, uh, it's just a personal journey and uh, artistic uh, project. Um, sometimes I feel a little bit um, guilty because the people open the mind to tell me the, the stories, but I'm not a journalist. I'm not uh, able to do much that they are hoping me to do uh, for them. Um, but I, I, I think uh, I, I, I feel in depth with them because of their story uh, make me to understand uh, the country and the life and uh, uh, do my next uh, artistic project uh, uh, better. Um, but uh, if that's an opportunity, I think I will go to uh, see some of them, but I, I don't think I will take a picture of them anymore. So I, uh, so I wanted to know if you are aware that what you present here uh, in China is in a way universal, because I can't think of a city in the world that this progress, this change, is happening and it impacts individuals that are very similar to the individuals you picture than you showed uh, in your photographs. Yes, uh, I think I'm 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 aware of this. Um, it's what I it's a the one of the archive uh, helped me to understand this. This experience is universal. Um, not, this thing is not only happening in China, it's happening everywhere, just in different, different, different format. And the uh, people has a different way to deal with it. So that helped me to deal with and uh, uh, what happened here, what happened in Alabama, and uh, what happened in upstate New York, where I spent uh, two years time during the pandemic over there. And uh, yeah, and all the neighborhood in Harlem and uh, understand the uh, Columbia University, what they're doing with us. and. Uh, uh, the African American, the neighborhood, um, the things. Yeah, I think uh, I'm fully aware of it. And I hope this archive project, in fact, um, to Chinese people, um, will, will be a lot of them, a lot, lot of us will be able to understand that too. And uh, we are not anything exceptional. Um, China is not place, it is ex extraordinary place, it, but it's not place ex exceptional. That's a, if that's a problem, it could it could be solved. But some problem probably the similar universal problem never going to be solved. But yeah, we're well, just a part of this universe, I guess.
It means like people cannot settle down or ca can't settle down. So why you are so interested or have passion about this topic? <laughs> hmm. Oh, thanks for the questions. Um, it's very, I'm very interesting. I'm very interested that you had that impression, but um, I guess a very impulsive because uh, in China, China changed so much, right? And uh, for time before my son was born, I had a very uh, intensive traveling schedule to China. Sometimes a seven a seven times a year or this kind of thing. So between the two trips, only sometimes like one month, even less than one month, shorter than one month. And then every time I go back, I felt I'm missing something. I missed something. So I impulsively, obsessively uh, taking photos wherever I go just to take the photos. And I was thinking, um, I don't want the history, um, my memory just to flow down into the history. And so I want to take it. So you will see, that's why I continue to go back in, in that way and um, almost recklessly. <laughs> Um, given, I was just wondering if you were working with other artists in the, with respect to the fact that this archive is meant to be like a living organism, right? And given that like China is so big, there's so many people and the change happens at such a rapid pace. So is there, is that, like, is that a thing that you've been interested in or is that possible? What, what's, what's the last word you said? Sorry. What's the last word you just said? I, I couldn't. Possible, yeah, yeah. Like, is I are there other artists also doing this work to expand the archive with in, in that direction? Um, the Chinese uh, artist, um, the archive is kind of popular uh, way to do the art uh, uh, project right now. And uh, I know a one uh, artist. Uh, his I mean, his name is uh, I forgot. Uh, one one artist, uh, I forgot his uh, fr uh, full name. His name is Bill. He's from uh, he's from Hong Kong. He's doing things uh, uh, sort of like archiving uh, archive project about the history in Hong Kong and uh, Taiwan. Um, and another Chinese uh, filmmaker uh, also the I, I, he's a little younger than me. He do a lot of uh, uh, films works about the colonialism in. Uh, coastal China too, so had a lot of uh, this kind of a quality, yeah. But um, in terms of the archive um, project, the artist, I'm uh, one interesting uh, Mexican artist. His name is Iñaki, and he does he archive his uh, grandfather's photographs, and uh, he made a website called the JR Plaza. It's called the Word and the Photo. So that's interesting. You can search it. And you put the word in there and the photo will come up and the, each photo will associate with a bunch of words and uh, also associate with not associate with a bunch of words. So um, you, you can take a look at that too. That's quite a very interesting way to do things. He's uh, working with the photography, but he doesn't take any photos. He just uh, work with his uh, grandfather's uh, big collection of photos. That's it. Thank you very much. Putting the uh, the website up or the people standing around talking. Let's go. Twenty people. What's all available? I think, you know, uh, we do wanted to take this opportunity to acknowledge uh, Hai's work uh, together with us, in, you know, this collaborative work. Obviously, you see his talents of this photographer, you know, through these works. But working with him 
over the last almost seven months, five months or so, we see behind the scenes of his organization skills, his dedication and professionalism in many ways. Um, you know, the team, our whole team are looking at these um, artistic books. For instance, he manually draw his maps, timelines. He's just, he has a way, well, he has shown some of those, uh, you know, uh, the same way, you know, recordings, sound clips. He's just, he's very organized. And the organization also is reflected in some other ways. Today, I think we are extremely happy that some of our Parson students register to come to the event. In the past, India China Institute's programs, a lot of times are research heavy. Uh, but for Hai's work, um, obviously it's closely connected to India China Institute's research. We mentioned those keywords, urbanization, mobilize, uh, mo uh, mobility, uh, citizenship, et cetera. For Hai, when he first came to us, well, this is a, 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 I would say for the last 10 years or so, I keep on receiving emails from Hai. Hai came to India China Institute to talk about uh, some of his work in the past. Yeah, well, he's not, well, not particularly asking for fundings, but in this case, I, I, I think I wanted to share these two points, especially with the young audience here. So he, I don't think that he's sending emails just to me or you know my directors here. It is pretty much a mass emailing, updating what he does, updating his progresses, his exhibitions, his sometimes life stories. We know that he has a son and I know his son is six years old now. Those are just from regular mails. And I must admit, sometimes I miss, I miss one or two of them. I do not always open all of those mails. Occasionally, <laughs> I, I do not respond, but, I think those as an artist, you know, you wanted your work to be known to other people and that emailing did that. Um, it was, I think the beginning of this year, Hai has an exhibition called uh, Innocence, Age of Inno Innocence, Age of Innocence. The uh, Age of Innocence. Um, in the uh, in Makiko Makayo Mayako gallery. yeah in a gallery in New York that collection is also capturing the pictures of uh, I think between 203 20 207 it's a span of time this work that we are discussing here uh looking for her region and the fiction of life of everyday life spans almost a decade for 11 years or so. That too is, is you know, it's, it's a collection of photos because it is, again, on urbanization, on the topics that India China Institute is looking into. It is really our research cluster. He and I had a subsequent phone call. And here you are, you know, the first set of people to look at the launch of this site. And I think when he expressed that he wanted these photos to be on a public platform, to be accessible to researchers, to scholars and the general public, that is an appeal, it is really appealing to us. Um, we are the research institution once again, we have lots of words, we have lots of books, but well, these are a visual a presentation of many of our researchers' work. And we, to me, it's very interesting. I, I thought, oh, well, some of the photos probably our researchers would be dying to get to incorporate into their books. That's one reflection, right? The persistence of letting you know uh, these holiday greeting cards is not hurting anyone. And I'm really happy to have received them. And then that brings us to this wonderful opportunity to do this collaborative work. The second is what I noticed, which is related to this persistence again, is he's revisiting this place, right? He went to 
the same place, take the photos. So you have the comparison between then and now and perhaps future. He says he probably would not go back. But I'm, I'm thinking of this. If anyone in this audience, our young audience, you are here or you are there, some people are online, you are in China. Due to COVID, I was not able to go back to China. Someone is taking He Guizhen's photos. What, where is He Guizhen? What, how, is, how is his family doing? Especially in this period of time, it could be a continuation of this work. Who knows, right? Um, working with him as a you know visiting artist at India China Institute and also you know collaborator of this project i find him to be extremely professional dedicated and super super responsive so i would say hey well you know one of you contact him maybe that's some, the beginning of some collaborative work India China Institute, we do have our fellows who are not able to go to the research site, work collaboratively uh, with colleagues over there and then publish their papers that way. So during this, this very difficult time, whether it's for research or for taking photos even, um, I thought that probably uh, you know, may, may spark, may ignite a spark, and perhaps inspire someone. Then that's that. You know, we are doing a good contribution towards your professional life, towards the research work that India China Institute is always. In, you know, that's what we do. Um, again, I think we are super happy to see so many young faces here. <laughs> Um, we obviously thank Hai and also our team, you know, the leadership of Mark and Manjuri here. Uh, we have really um, got lots of supports from the university, the website consulting Jeff, you know, the facilities, Parsons colleagues who are giving us these exhibition space. A lot of times what for the exhibition here on campus, it takes a year or two to require the space in order to put up the work. Everybody sees the meaning of this particular project. And, and that's where we're able to do this. And for that, again, I thank you all for coming. And I hope that you get something when you walk out of the door. <laughs>